even before the Congress, I did not know what the Wassenaar arrangements are. And I learned now it's an international treaty that has some security implications for us. And all about that will now tell you Walter, Nate Cardozo, um, Mag uh, Meredith Patterson, and Richard Tynan. Have a warm welcome. Thank you. Just to introduce us briefly, Nate, who's on my far right, is uh, uh, with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, that probably doesn't need any further introduction. Uh, Meredith is mostly responsible for the language uh, security. Well, I call it a cult, but that's apparently not nice to call it. Um, Richard uh, is the chief technologist with Privacy International, which probably does not need much further introduction as well. Um, I'm just a loudmouth who submitted the panel and have been helping out a bit with Fukami in Brussels. Fukami is on behalf of CCC involved in this policy area, uh, trying to uh, make things less wrong on this topic. And um, basically what we will briefly do is discuss, well, what the hell is Boston to begin with? Uh, how much of a problem should, is it for the IT security community? And, and how we came here and go through with this. And basically, we were actually not supposed to have a panel to begin with on the program. And for that reason, we will open up the floor to questions from the audience in about 10 minutes or so. Um, so uh, start thinking about um, questions to the panelists, because it will be kind of a partially a conversation on the stage, but also a conversation with this, well, not necessarily intimate room, but hopefully it will be a good conversation. Anyway, Vassana, what is it? Um, it's a very posh suburb of uh, The Hague, the Netherlands. King of the Netherlands lived there with ghettoish places like you see on screen. It's also a framework between most of the industrialized nations on export controls and weapons technology, mostly conventional weapons. And signatories range from most, basically all the NATO members plus Russia. Yeah, most of the former Warsaw Pact countries are also signatories to Wassena. And it is actually technically not a treaty, but has a lower st status in, in international law. And what it more or less uh, does, it it's sets policies on conventional weapons as well as dual use goods. And until December 2013, that didn't touch much upon IT security issues apart from cryptography, remnant of the past crypto wars, which are reheating again. But in December 2013, two new elements were introduced as dual use technologies. And the first one is surveillance technology, and the second one is called intrusion software. And to give you an idea of the definitions of these two, this is what the definition of surveillance uh, systems is. Basically, anything that can intercept at the, at the carry grade IP networks and um, can target specific selectors. And I'm bringing up this definition not because it's such an enjoyable definition to read, uh, but from my perspective, as someone who's interested in the intersection of policy, law, and technology is, it's very fascinating that this, this idea of having surveillance technology considered a um, weapons-like technology that is worthy of regulation, that we, because you don't want to have it fall in the wrong hands, like stream, regime, etc. Um, that in that process, there were very funny exceptions made in surveillance technology. Because if it's for a marketing purpose, or for quality of service, or quality of experience, whatever that may be, then all of a sudden it's not deemed to fall in these export regulations. And conversely, there's the definition of intrusion software. Any of the following. Extraction of data or information from a computer or network capable device, or the modification of system or user data, or 
the modification of the standard execution path of a program or process in order to allow the execution of externally provided instructions. I'm not a techie, but having JavaScript sent from an HTTP server to a browser, does that alter the execution path of the browser? I think it does. Um, this may be a bit of a broad definition. And to give you an idea why we brought this up now is, and is, is that this arrangement will be translated into legislation on, uh, in the signatory countries. And I cannot really speak for the US side. That will briefly be done by Nate uh, when I'm finished talking about the European side. In the European Union, you have a regulation that basically copies the list of cover technologies by the Vosna arrangement and says, if you want to export any of this stuff, you must apply to, for an export permit in your member state. And the member states have then some additional rules on that. The country where I'm from, the Netherlands, happens to have a royal decree saying, thou shalt not export any of the stuff on the list in the regulation, basically meaning what's on the Vosna arrangement, and otherwise, you will be punishable by law. That particular European regulation is up for review, and that review will also include the updates that have been, in the meantime, to the Wassenaar arrangement. The current EU regulation on this topic is from 2009, and there have been about yearly annual updates of the Wassenaar arrangement. So, in the upcoming two years, there will be a new European regulation that may or may not affect your ability as an IT security expert from Europe to, let's say, travel to China. That we don't even know what the Commission actually will be doing on this, on this topic, but we do know what on the US side of things is happening. And for that, I refer to Nate. Uh, thanks, Walter. So on the US side, uh, the Bureau of Industry and Security, which is a division of the Department of Commerce, is in charge of implementation of the Vosnar arrangement. In uh, May of this year, the Department of Commerce uh, released its proposed rule, its proposed implementation. Uh, and it was atrocious. It was, uh, it was a shock to pretty much everyone involved. And um, it caused uh, an enormous amount of fear and uncertainty uh, in the InfoSec community, both in the United States and abroad. Intrusion software is not actually controlled under the BIS implementation. Uh, only technology and knowledge implementing intrusion software is controlled, uh, as well as command and control systems for intrusion software. The problem is, uh, under the United States uh, definitions of deemed exports, uh, in the UK there's a similar concept of intangible knowledge transfer, simply talking about something like uh, an exploit could be considered a deemed export and therefore controlled. Um, so this is really, really, really bad. Um, so as part, uh, another part of the US implementation is if any of this software contains cryptographic or cryptanalytic capability, uh, the, the person applying for the export license must on demand turn over source code to the National Security Agency. And you can tell uh, who put that little nugget into the US implementation. Um, so essentially what it means is that if you're a US researcher, it, well, okay, so these rules haven't gone into, the effect in, into effect in the United States, but if they do, what it will mean is if you're a researcher in the United States or a United States person, so someone with citizenship or a green card, uh, you have to dump all your ODAs to the NSA before you can talk about them to anyone else, even in private. Um, that's problematic, to say the least. Um, also, what the regulations don't do, they don't actually stand in the way of someone like Hacking Team or Finn Fisher selling their stuff to Ethiopia, Bahrain, or the Saudis. Uh, all you need to do is get a license, and as we could tell from the hacking team dump, uh, getting a global export license under Vosnar is relatively easy. Uh, so what, what do the regulations do? They make bug bounties conferences and small teams working on defensive or offensive research uh, next to impossible. They make distributing things like Metasploit or pen testing tools nearly impossible. 
and they create legal uncertainty for folks doing research on essentially anything interesting. Uh, if you could get a security paper accepted here at CCC, uh, it would not be exportable under Vasnar. That's, of course, a gross oversimpl oversimplification. Um, I began my journey into Vasnar uh, when the BIS released its proposed rule. Uh, EFF was not closely following Vasnar in 2013 when uh, the intrusion software and network surveillance definitions were entered. Uh, I can speak only for myself, but I, I regret that fact. Um, okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to have Meredith explain a little bit from her perspective as an American living in Europe how this may affect her life. But I also will announce that from now on, um, people who want to ask questions to these panelists, just, just walk through a microphone with a, and, and we'll, uh, from now on the floor is open basically. But Meredith? Yeah, so I'm originally from Texas, but I've been living in Belgium since 2009. So this actually makes me subject to both the US and EU implementations of, uh, uh, of the Wassenaar arrangement. Um, the ones that, and like uh, Nate was just saying, the ones that are most relevant to me are the deemed export and intangible transfer um, regulations, which I have to point out, I mean, those are, those are things that like the US and the UK came up with, and I guess it was the UK that presented it to the EU because intangible transfer was totally, you know, the topic of the day. Um, at one of the, uh, the meetings in Brussels on, uh, on the Wassenaar implementation that I went to. What does intangible transfer mean in practical terms? Well, in, I mean, in practical terms, it means that if you have an idea in your head that qualifies as an export, you can't cross a border. And I don't know how they plan to enforce that. Oh, it, it's way worse than that. Uh, what it means, so I'll, I'll give a, a, a discussion, I'll, you know, I'll talk about it in, in practical terms. Open Whisper Systems is based in San Francisco. Uh, it produces Signal, Tech Secure, uh, all those lovely uh, things that I have on my device so that I can talk to people here. Um, and if there are people with multiple citizenships, even sitting around a conference table in San Francisco, speaking about it to someone without a US citizenship is a deemed export. So you don't even have to cross a border. All you have to do is open your mouth to get into trouble with Fosnar. Yeah, and so I'm in the situation where, you know, because of the citizenship I have and the place I live, there are two different sets of regulations that can basically constrain me from traveling or from even talking to anybody because I understand the general principle of how to construct exploits from differences in how input handlers parse things. That's obviously not the intended result of this, but you know it's only one of a lot of side effects that the the the, the people who wrote this language were clearly not thinking of when they wrote it. And that brings us. We have now invented a new class of thought crime. Uh, and uh, on that happy note, I would like to ask Richard um, uh, how we got here. Um, and I, well, I just follow on with the press your button. Press your button. Process. Uh, the um, intangible technology transfer, um, giving lectures and, and various things like that are, are problematic, even if you don't necessarily know who's in the room. If they are uh, a foreign citizen, they can take it elsewhere. And there's also another problem that if you were to go to a company and potentially disclose some of this information in your own jurisdiction, but that company had many offices around the world, which most companies that, that we use products in our everyday lives uh, are based around the world, they may actually send on that information internally, uh, which may also include crossing a border to various other different teams so that the other, t uh, the other teams could potentially fix uh, the problem. In terms of uh, the starting point for this, uh, I, I guess it probably started back in 2010, 2011, where the goal was to uh, limit the spread of uh, tools like FinFisher or tools with the capabilities of FinFisher um, to regimes like Ethiopia and Morocco and various other different places where we see that technology been used um, very, very, uh, in a very, very nasty manner for journalists and human rights defenders. 
and very often these countries, uh, what we've seen is they wouldn't even have the technical capabilities to develop this stuff by themselves. And ironically, in one of the hacking team dumps, the, the guys were very, very concerned at a particular country's technical skills uh, and their ability to use their tools, not that they wouldn't get what they wanted, but simply that just by screwing up the use of these tools would actually reveal their use and potentially uh, uh, provide a sample or some material that uh, techies could then use to, to counteract them. So that was, the, I guess, the starting point. And as I understand it, uh, back at that time, Vassanar was considered a very uh, attractive target. You essentially lobby one uh, organization who can pitch uh, text into the agreement, and if it's all agreed, by default, you get up to 41 different states who, who, would, uh, who would follow suit. But of course, as we've seen, the implementation, the text, the various things like that have uh, not been ideal, in fact, far from ideal. And many of the, the not only the technical definitions are, are not necessarily correct, but the, the lack of inclusion of factors such as the intention of the individuals when they're uh, exporting this stuff. There's no distinction between an export for, for example, generating uh, new snort rules to detect malware that's uh, uh, on people's machines or antivirus signatures or potentially um, the disclosure of uh, malware that represents an entire class of new type of, of, of attack which would allow uh, much more general safeguards to be put in place like DEP, ASLR, those kind of things. So the, the starting point I think was, was uh, well intentioned and the implementation as we saw uh, has left a lot to be desired and I think it's the question now is whether Vassanar itself can uh, capture the nuances of the problem uh, to achieve the goal, but also to not screw things up royally for uh, the entire internet security and the very uh, infrastructure that we rely on on a daily basis. But I do think we also have to look beyond the text of Wassenaar itself, because deemed export and intangible transfer were bolt-ons from, you know, you know from, from the US and the UK. So we have to look at the implementation yep. and shepherd that through as well as the text. So I, I would say that the, I, I, I totally agree with Richie uh, in, in that the intention was good. Uh, but in, in my mind at least, the trying, trying to make a legalistic definition to separate good software, defensive stuff, to bad software, offensive stuff, is a fool's errand. The definitional problems overwhelm any possible benefit here. Uh, the chilling effect of a bad definition, which is exactly what we have, is worse than any of the possible benefits, especially because, you know, as the, one of the founders of EFF said in 1995 or 1996, uh, the net interprets censorship as damage and routes around it, right? This software isn't magic. FinFisher and Hacking Team are barely more functional than VNC. I'm exaggerating, but you get the point. Um, it's the service and support that actually matter Right, you can it, it, you can give Ethiopia Finfisher, and the IT folk there won't know what to do with it um, without the service and support. And it's the service and support contracts that actually matter. Um, so take that for what software isn't weaponry, right? Software isn't guns. You can't control it in the same way that you can control the export of physical devices. So. Um, my, in, in, in my opinion, trying to fix the definitions in Bosnar um, is, uh, you know, I admire people who think they can do it, but I don't delude myself to think that I can do it. So I think we need to ditch intrusion software from Bosnar altogether. Okay, we have a first question from the room. So uh, one important note for the Bosnar is, um, and you haven't mentioned it yet, uh, open source is, is exempt from Bosnar. Well. So open source is sometimes kind of exempt. Uh, if for, you're for the purpose of this discussion, it's exempt. There really is not a bright line. I tried very hard to get... Um, yeah, public domain. OK, public domain is exempt. That yes. ain't the same as open source. Yeah. Well, there's a slight problem to interject here. Right. Um, when you interpret, interpret international treaties, 
per the Treaty of Vienna, you're supposed to use the common interpretation of words, unlike other legal documents which have created their own reality. So public domain is no longer necessarily a copyright-like -like thing. There's two problems. The Washington Arrangement is not a formal treatment, so I don't actually know how to interpret it. The second problem is I've been looking for exemptions like that as well. I'm nowhere near as much an expert as the other people are at this table. There are much clearer exemptions for, let's say, open source or source code availability for the crypto bits, but less so for this. Yeah. And I would, I would just add to that that uh, while, yes, in the, in the text on, on open software, the general technology notes and general software notes, um, open source software, as I understand it, doesn't, isn't always open source, at least in the initial embryonic stages. And while, yes, it may become open source later on and, we, and may become in the public domain later on, while it's sitting on a laptop of a developer who is yet to commit their, their changes into a repository that is open source, to the best of my understanding, that is still not public domain information. That that is still information that resides on the laptop of the individual or individuals who are uh, creating the next version of the particular open source software. And this, this uh, uh, regime may limit the ability of those individuals to communicate um, in the formation of uh, the next the better improvements to the open source software. And so even things like we've had very conflicting statements from government saying things along the lines of, well, if, you, if you're working on something and you intend to present it at a conference at some time in the future, well, then maybe it's open source. But how are we supposed to prove that? How are we supposed to demonstrate that when we're working on uh, bits of code and bits of technology, not all of them are going to work. Some of them aren't ever going to see the light of day. And it's at that process before things become open source or before things become in the public domain that can actually limit the, the ability for people to, to conduct their work. And, and to make matters worse, the general software note, which is what Richie was discussing, uh, is not included in all of the national implementations, yeah. including the BIS implementation. The yeah. BIS implementation specifically exempts the general software note exemption. There's another question um, on the left. Um, so I wanted to share um, an experience I had in dealing with Vassenar for voice encryption and how it may be related with that. Uh, for export of a strong encryption product, uh, there are a, a precise specification whether it fit in the category of a mass encryption tools or whether it's subject to export control. And uh, it dictates very precise rule, like uh, um, if the end user is able to, to change the encryption algorithm, if the end user can acquire directly uh, without and can install without any substantial support from the manufacturer. And those are specific kind of uh, details related to the uh, way of deploying and the purpose of uh, uh, the technology for voice encryption, the, for strong encryption, uh, subject to export. So I'm wondering if uh, it will not be useful to think and propose uh, from a policy standpoint of view a set of rules that create the boundaries of what should be subject to export regulation and what should not be subject, exactly like strong encryption uh, is already in the provision of a Vassinar arrangement. But I would, I would say that it's very, very difficult to look at a specific piece of software, just the ones and zeros, and make a determination on that basis. And so without the ability for uh, an agreement such as this or a, a regime to achieve the, the stated objective that I said at the start, if it can't capture things like what you just said about what the, the intent of the individual who's going to receive it or what uh, they could do with it, uh, and that was ex expressly, well, it wasn't included in the uh, intrusion software definition or any of the exemptions in, uh, in Vassanar as it was and the transposing legislation into the EU. I mean, it's, it's also not always obvious uh, on its face what a piece of software actually does. Um, if you've ever looked at the underhanded C contest, there are a lot of examples of software that appears to do one thing but actually does something else. I mean, I, have, I don't think we've seen this as an export controls dodge yet, but it's certainly possible. Um, and just to, to pile on on the crypto front, uh, you know, it has long been EFF's position that crypto should not be export regulated at all. Uh, in the United States, 
Uh, we have pub there, there's very little uh, regulation on publicly available crypto, so open source crypto. All you have to do is notify the NSA that you're putting it online. You don't actually have to ask for permission. Most people don't even do that, and it's not really enforced as far as I understand. And following on from Meredith's uh, point, there's a, there's a very interesting competition that's held every year. Uh, and I think based on uh, a Linux vulnerability that was, that was found a few years ago where, where a semicolon was inserted, um, that to any cursory reading of the, of the code might indicate that things were hunky-dory. But in reality, what it allowed was um, basically anybody to gain root on, on the box. And it was all in there in, uh, in, in the open source. And there's a competition each year to find new and innovative ways to uh, hide in plain sight, essentially, um, issues with software that just a cursory analysis might not actually uh, reveal. We have um, several people wanting to ask questions over there. Okay. Uh, so first off, thank you so much for this panel. It's been very informative. I have two questions that are really uh, tightly related. Uh, the first one is coming from a basic knowledge of policy standpoint. It seems that if you have a, an agreement that was presented, then there was probably a chain of events like meetings and so on that led to the formation of that agreement. And I'm curious, is it possible to go through the meeting notes and infer who introduced these terms and what the context <coughs> of the discussions were? The second question that I have, how have these kinds of uh, agreements actually been enforced in the past? Because if this was introduced in 2009, I assume that there were things before then, because cryptography is not a new thing. I think the first question is best to be asked mm -hmm. to Richie. In the second one, I'd like to refer to Nate. I also want to note, um, that when asking questions, we are very thankful for your gratitude, but let's stick to the questions. Um, so I guess the first time, and, and look, uh, obviously I may not be aware of the entire picture, but the first time um, Privacy International became aware of the text was almost before, uh, days before it was actually um, completed. So the, to the best of our knowledge, there wasn't a, a, a consultation process and it's almost a, a problem with the actual, uh, I guess, the drafting process that, that people were involved not only too late, but that the, the potential consequences were huge and they should have been involved at a very, very early stage so we didn't have to get to this point that we're in now where the, the implications are, are very real. I think most of you will be aware of HP pulling out of a, of a bug bounty contest during the year. Um, simply because of the, under, maybe it was Microsoft, I can't remember which company it was, um, because there was uh, uh, question marks over whether they could actually have um, people showing up and presenting bugs and zero days and things like that, and what legal regime, how did they need to get a, an export control license for every country and, and things like that. So there is tangible uh, uh, evidence that this stuff is, is stopping things, but as far as I'm aware, there was no uh, consultation outside of governments uh, who are drafting this. Um, and so, uh, Aesthetics, your second question, how are these so sorts of agreements enforced? Uh, the answer, on, I can only answer, I'm a US lawyer, I can only answer in United States terms. Uh, they're enforced by the Department of Commerce, uh, and they're enforced sort of very rarely and very selectively. So that would be a big problem in the EU because selective enforcement is like, you're not allowed to do that in Belgium. Mm, yeah, well, Belgium being Belgium. Uh, uh. But that, that selective enforcement gives rise to a chilling effect. The mere possibility that it could be enforced is often sufficient to trigger the negative consequences that everybody, I think, here and in the audience have, which is that you want people to engage actively in, in improving things and improving the software that we use. Uh, and that necessitates, in the modern age, the ability for people to collaborate across borders. And so I'm not necessarily sure whether uh, the fact that it could be um, enforced, people could go to jail, which obviously is, is, is a disgrace, but um, the, the, the chilling effect of people actually engaging in this research in the first place. You don't want to be in the receiving end of enforcement. I've been specifically told there are questions from the internet. Uh, yes, thank you. I have a bunch of questions regarding open source again. Um, in detail, what is the um, expected impact on projects like Metasploit, that's partly open source, you know, and uh, Kali Linux? So Metasploit, uh, the, the lawyers over at HackerOne um, 
not at HackerOne, at Rapid7, have determined that uh, the open source Metasploit projects and modules, uh, there will be no impact on them. The Metasploit Pro, however, is subject to the license. Um, so Metasploit open source, just fine, keep exporting, keep using, keep posting. Uh, Metasploit Pro uh, is going to become a lot more expensive. Um, just another question from your backlog of internet questions. Okay. Um, yes, there's one question. Um, what is the, the detail problem? Is it that um, exploits would be more open or is there also a financial aspect in this? Individuals would be criminally liable for um, for having exploits, basically. Oh, uh, having exploits and crossing borders. Or talking about exploits to foreign nationals. So. Uh, hi, um, I'm, a, um, I'm an academic from the United Kingdom, and um, uh, I was wondering if you could comment on the possibilities of this affecting research, particularly and thinking of my own research would be classified under the, the uh, very broad definition of surveillance. Um, and the follow-up question is, um, what about teaching? How am I expected to teach an international group of students in my university um, without an export license? I'm afraid you need an export license if you've got international students in there because when you impart, it would be deemed an uh, intangible technology transfer in the sense that the transfer actually occurs in the heads of your students. When you've delivered that lecture and they go on to their, their countries, uh, that would be an intangible technology transfer. As far as and it's, it, it's really not clear. Like they're, they're, they are not drawing clear lines about what kind of research. It, I mean, because politicians have been, have been telling us to our faces, oh, researchers don't have anything to worry about, but they don't tell us why. Um, and, so when I, and so when I ask, okay, well, why, for what reason do I not need to worry about, um, about intangible knowledge transfer? You know, I just sort of get patted on the head and, and they move on to the next question. Um, nobody really seems willing to clarify how this is going to, you know, how this is actually going to be brought down on research, with the exception of Australia. Australia apparently seems perfectly happy to just, like, shut off all crypto teaching in the entire country. Um, but, you know, that's Australia. Um, and we've, we've already seen, and I'm now forgetting uh, the gentleman's name, but we've already seen one doctoral dissertation um, heavily redacted by, the, by his committee in the UK um, because of Vosnar, and that's fucked up. And, the, and incidents like that are going to produce continued chilling effects. Fewer people will get into research because who wants to end up in the situation like that poor guy in the US who, uh, who did a geography PhD on um, maps of critical infrastructure. Department of Homeland Security suppressed his thesis. Um, if you don't get to graduate, that kind of wastes the, all, all that time you spent on a PhD. And so like, that's, fewer people will be coming into the field, and people who are already in the field are going to, you know, are, are going to have a lot of fear and worry about, you know, am I about to get busted for trying to publish a paper? Um, I'm also not sure what security research actually is, and when security research <laughs> stops and ends. Uh, are pen testers security researchers? Are people who go out and just tinker with software and say reverse engineer bits of bits of uh, bits of code simply because that's what they like doing, uh, where they're not affiliated to say an official university? Are they covered? And so many of the many of the supposed protections or exemptions for things like academic material, I just it just doesn't make any sense to me about what indeed what what the definition of a security researcher is and whether it includes pen testers and their collaboration cross borders to 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 ensure that all their tools are as up to date as possible and i'm in exactly that boat i am not affiliated with a university and i do not do security for my day job i'm a bog standard programmer at nuance um all of the security stuff i do i do in my copious free time so i wouldn't even be protected by uh protections that only apply to academics. Well, luckily in the U.S. you don't have to worry about that because there is no security research <laughs> yeah, exemption. Yeah. But Meredith is in Brussels, not in the U.S. So maybe a very <laughs> short follow-up question here. Is there any chance to get out of here um, claiming that it's freedom of speech? So this kind um, for the academic uh, area, so... I can give you an answer from the European perspective. Yeah. And Nate may probably respond from a U.S. perspective. 
um, as a kind of groundwork for those poor European countries which don't even have a constitution like the United Kingdom um, and other kind of backwards monarch monarchies like the Netherlands and, and all that. The, the, the European uh, Convention for Human Rights is kind of actually the, the, the real constitution. And then Article 10 says that freedom of expression should, shall not be, well, I'm, not, I'm paraphrasing, I'm not quoting literally, <laughs> but it shall not be, there shall not be prior restraint unless by law and proportionate to the public interest for which that law is brought into being. So there's no evident cutoff there why you could or could not have that. We already do have the Cybercrime Convention, which has equally chilling, well, not equally, but also chilling effects on security issues. It has never been challenged in that court, as far as I'm aware. So, uh, but it's a very good question, basically, can we fix this? And uh, after Nate covers the, the, uh, the First Amendment issues, I'd like to move on to that bit. Sure, thank you. I'll, I'll just follow on with what, what was that there. Uh, freedom of expression, at least, uh, as you said, in the UK and the EU, is what's called a qualified right, like privacy is, and the qualification is based on law. But uh, many times freedom of expression uh, can or, or can be compelled to yield to privacy rights of individuals. So, for example, would my doctor be able to engage their freedom of expression rights to breach confidentiality and publish information, and should I be able to prevent that from happening. So not only is there a, a, um, a balancing act between freedom of expression and the general legal regime in a country, uh, freedom of expression and privacy very often can collide uh, in, in, in the real world. From a US legal perspective, if, these, if the proposed implementation went into effect, um, uh, I would love to take the case that would bring it down. Um, one of EFF's first major cases was Bernstein, which you probably know better as DG, DJB, uh, versus United States Department of Justice, and we got uh, code declared as speech, which was good, um, and we got uh, cryptography pulled out of the uh, United States munitions list and into a much uh, lower level of export control. Um, so I, I think that in at least under US law, at least for open source software, um, even if it wasn't publicly available, even if it wasn't public domain, I think you would have a very, very good argument uh, that the regulations would fail under the First Amendment. And then there's another thing under the, US, under the United States Constitution, which is if a criminal law, and all of these export controls are criminal, uh, is not readily understandable by a person of average education and intelligence, then it fails. Uh, it's, the doctrine is called void for vagueness. Um, so I would say that this would fail as void. Yeah, I'm, not sure I'm also that. about this far from registering the Church of the Weird Machines as an actual church <laughs> in the United States, and then we can get freedom of religion into the mix. <laughs> Amen, brother. <laughs> oh, please do so. I, I must emphasize that I'm not aware of any European jurisdiction that has such a lovely concept. As void for vagueness? Yes, definitely. No, I don't think any of the European countries have such an exception. Basically, if you don't understand the law, it's still your problem. I blame France. Um, well, yeah, let's not blame the French for everything. Um, I think there's some, there's some jurisdictions which have the phrase that ignorance of the law is no excuse. Yeah. And I think that unfortunately might be operative in, uh, in many of those situations. But uh, since you're speaking, how fixable is this? Um, well, so if we look at, at some of the, the objectives that were, were set out uh, at the start in terms of the, the, the very well-intentioned, very well um, kind of you know, there was, a, there was a, a very bad problem there to be fixed. There are a number of, of potential shortcomings in Vassanar itself, which I think we need to look at addressing and potentially saying, well, if a tool or if a, if a mechanism that, that we're looking at isn't able to capture uh, the kind of nuances of this problem, that, you know, we may need to look at, at a different mechanism. So some of the ones that are, are kind of open questions is that, that Vassanar, um, obviously looks at, at everything in the basis of the ones and zeros and not on the intention, as we said before. Um,
brought in court on DJB's behalf, and uh, it was it was such a catch-22 for uh, the Department of Commerce that they that they eventually backed down completely. And to add to that, um, going to court. Say, sorry. Yeah. Going to court is something you do after legislation is passed that is clearly unconstitutional or otherwise contravening your fundamental rights. We are both in the US and in Europe in the position that the pretty vague criteria of WASNA have to be transposed in more concrete legislation and that process is still not finished and especially on the European side. Um, the only tangible thing we have is a non-legislative report by Marietje Schaake, uh, an MEP. Um, and while that non-legislative report is, has not been ideal, um, as we managed to get in amendments, to specifically acknowledge that this has potential for chilling effects on research, although we inserted the word bona fide research, which I regret <laughs> in hindsight. <laughs> of course, it's probably not helpful either. Um, but at least um, there is potential to have a European implementation of this bit in Wassenaar, which may be revised within Wassenaar in the near future, but also in the, in the, in the, in the European implementation to, to make this less bad, but I'm not sure whether it's um, how that will survive that process. Um, on that... The, I mean, the most frustrating thing about all of this to me is that we keep finding ourselves at daggers with people who are supposed to be our allies. Like, we're supposed to be on the same side uh, as the anti-surveillance people, but what's happened is well-meaning anti-surveillance people who don't understand the technical landscape propose what sounds like a good idea to them without ever, uh, you know, without ever actually asking technical people. Then the NSA and GCHQ get involved and they push their agenda and the technical language ends up constraining the people who the surveillance, uh, the anti-surveillance people are supposed to be allies with. I mean, and then we have to, you know, then it ends up being our problem to massage people's egos and get them to, you know, and find them a way to save face when they're backing down. And I'm sorry, I'm not very good at that personally. Katie Masuris did a fantastic job of it um, a couple of months ago. But, you know, we're kind of an abrasive tribe. Like, you know, being nice to people is not really our job. Um, well, it, maybe it is, but... <laughs> Still, I mean, it's extremely frustrating to be put into this situation that we didn't ask to be put into in the first place. And so I'd also like to, you know, I, if, if we can get into, like, how can we avoid this happening next time, that would be real nice, too. But we also didn't learn the mistakes from the crypto wars. So it's almost like this is the, the problems with, um, that happened back in the 90s seem to be repeating themselves. And the lessons that were learned then seem to cyclically go out the window. And uh, unfortunately, I just wonder what in 10 years time they'll do next. On a happy note. Oh, question. sorry, uh, to interrupt at that point, please first a question from the internet. Thank you, Harold. Um, the, the internet wants to know, are defensive technologies potentially going to be restricted by this arrangement? Yeah. Name one defensive yeah. technology that is not simultaneously yeah. an attack technology. Uh, or in other words, and, and this is a quote, will we end up with shitty everyday security because yes. good things yes. are not exported? Yes. Okay. yes. Yes. That will yes. happen if this gets implemented the way it's been written. So part of the problem is that the Vosnar arrangement definitions risk throwing away the solution that it's trying to solve. Um, you know, harden the endpoint, harden the server, harden the pipes. The tools to do all those things potentially get screwed by Vosnar. Right? We want to get secure devices and services into the hands of the folks who need them. Um, and banning pen testing tools is not the way to do that. Number one, please. So one, one of the insidious things about um, ITAR regulations, which is the arms trafficking regulations in the US, is that you are also liable for whatever end users of whatever you export is like, um, use it for. Is there similar things in like the implementation of the like Vassan argument? Is it just on the U.S. munitions list, or is it some different? It is not. It's not on the U.S. munitions list. It's on the EAR rather than ITAR, which is the Export Administration Regulation list. Um, so you're not liable for end use, end user. You're only liable for the export. And I at think least one, in the U.S. I, I think one of the problems that we're seeing is that traditionally uh, the kind of technologies that that the regulators have been used to dealing with 
uh, have been either solely military goods or so-called dual-use goods. And I think one of the things that are potentially this, this falls into is that there's actually uh, another use which is highly beneficial to the overall security of our systems, as the, the question from the internet pointed out, that that is one of the consequences. And so I, it, it's not necessarily clear that these things should be on something like a dual use list, but maybe we need uh, a, a recognition that the, the positives of these things uh, drastically outweigh the negatives and that by not having secure or not having the offensive tools to create the, the defensive protective measures that we potentially leave ourselves open to much cheaper, much uh, 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 ghost rat, whatever whatever rat you want to buy on uh, on uh, Alpha Bay or whatever the new uh, marketplace is. Another question from the internet, please. Thank you. Is this uh, Vazana arrangement draft openly available? Yeah. Where to get it? It's, it's not Google a draft. Google Vazana arrangement. Just Vazana.org. Yeah. And it's not a draft. It's just it's a done. published document on that site. Yeah, it's, it's final. It's not a draft. Number four, please. So I think the high level point I'm hearing here is that we have learned in the 1990s the Vasna arrangement with its weird reserved word definition of public domain, um, it's in scare quotes, and its weird framework has been an awful fit for crypto. Back then we sort of got ourselves out of it, that's great. It's coming back, it's an awful fit for the sort of possibly intrusive software we're talking about here, but actually it's possibly a little bit closer in its original intent to this software than it was to crypto. After all, its original intent is to keep that heavy truck out of its use as a troop transport. It is to keep this um, dual-use tool out of another army's hand. And what we're talking about here is keeping this overtly dual use attack technology out of the hands of an oppressive government that wishes uh, to use it against its citizens while maybe keeping it in the hands of researchers. So that framework sounds attractive. We're learning in this conversation. It probably has a lot of secondary effects that are unpleasant. I would like to hear from the panelists what your view is as to what a reasonable regulatory environment around these of, uh, offensive technologies looks like. I heard Nate say for crypto it is just take it out of export control, make it freely available, it is so beneficial. Are we saying the same thing about offensive technologies? I want, I want to give the mic to Meredith on that because she has published a paper on that together with Sergei Bratus. Well, I mean, I mean honestly, my, my perspective has changed over the course of this conversation, um, you know, because what Sergey and I have, have been writing about um, is how to change the language to something saner. Um, you know, one thing that's come up over and over again in discussions on the, the current language is that the, um, the language about execution paths is essentially meaningless. Um, nobody really agrees on what it means. Um, and even if they did agree on what it meant, it wouldn't actually help. Um, there's a wonderful paper from Usenix Security earlier this year um, called Control Flow Bending. Um, and they, they take a look at uh, control flow integrity systems. Um, this is, these are basically like systems that try to whitelist um, what paths through the control flow graph of a program uh, are considered legitimate. Um, and then you only whitelist those and anything else is considered an exploit. Um, turns out um, you can actually uh, have all kinds of memory corruption fun and get arbitrary computation with printf. You don't actually have to, uh, you, you, can, you, you can violate even theoretically, per you, you, you can get an exploit on even theoretically perfect control flow integrity. So like what they've described doesn't even make sense and doesn't help, but I mean, I think, what, I, I think what, what you said earlier about the provision of services is the far more important point. Like, the, you know, government of random third world nation is not gonna get a lot of use out of, you know, here's Finn Fisher, have fun. They need that support contract. Regulate that. 
or you know impose a strong liability regime. I'm, I'm lead counsel at EFF in our case where we're suing the government of Ethiopia for using Finn Fisher on a democracy activist in the United States. We were lucky enough to get a client who we were able to catch Ethiopia using Finn Fisher red-handed within the United States, which gives us jurisdiction to sue them. Um, but PI is, uh, is pursuing a case against uh, Gamma in the UK for the same thing. Um, you know, EFF was involved in cases against Cisco for helping build the Great Firewall and against IBM for building South Africa's apartheid identification card system. Uh, that kind of liability on the on the back end for doing the the stuff that we care about that that we that we don't want companies doing, um, I think would be possibly m much more successful um, and would have chilling effects on the on the bad stuff without touching the security research. And I, think I mean, that's, that's the really big ask because good luck getting any government to you know be willing to be sued for anything, but. Well, I think the, the one of the points in relation to the question is that, um, you know, to someone with a hammer, everything is a nail. And Vassanar is is the tool that was there, but as, as has been highlighted just there, there are potentially other alternatives uh, that may or may not be, be, be better. And maybe the, the exploring whether the, the language can be fixed within Vassanar to take account of the various different uh, uh, situations or whether there's other mechanisms in place, I think, needs to be explored. Yeah, and as a lawyer, as someone with a law degree, everything looks like a lawsuit, so I'm like, sue them. <laughs> <laughs> um, question number four. Oh, I, I just um, have noticed something in a new South African cybersecurity, cyber crime legislation. I'm not sure if it's influenced by Vasana or if it's just the current environment. Um, and uh, yeah, basically in South Africa now, according to the cyber crime bill, um, uh, malware would include any electronic mechanical instrument or device that could create a vulnerability, modify or impair or interfere with the ordinary functioning of a device, computer or network. Uh, so that occurred to me that you know, if, if I modded my phone, for example, there would be malware on my phone, um, a whole lot of things. You know. And the second, the, it also got me thinking, um, how does one actually distinguish between possessing malware and then on the other side, the people who are owned uh, have being infected? Um, could that not be a catch-22 that might be useful in certain judicial contexts? I mean, um, an exploit is still an exploit that's still taken across a border if it's uh, in the hands of a researcher, an attacker, or possibly even an infected computer. We do have a problem already with the Cybercrime Convention, and in practice it's basically not really happened. So we have no ID. Because the, with the Cybercrime Convention, which is an entirely different framework than Vasna, uh, which again most industrialized nations have signed, uh -huh. um, it has become in most implementations a, a crime to possess a piece of malware. Even if you're just a victim, you're technically a criminal. I'm not aware of any public prosecutor stupid enough to pursue such a case. I would love to hear that, by the way. But, uh, South but Africa I, is a signatory to Wassenaar, though. I just looked it up. Um, but, and but I think under U.S. law, in, there, there's always an intent requirement yeah. for virtually every crime except possession of child porn. Um, so. If you're a victim of malware and you happen to cross a border, you don't have the intent to export, so no crime. And I think the, some of the other tools that might uh, fall into that would be things like Fuzzers, IDA Pro, that would you'd be able to manipulate various different bits and bobs through the through a decompiled uh, piece of software. But um, Nate, at the start, I think mentioned that the uh, the actual piece of malware itself, um, strictly speaking, or at least that's probably not fair, uh, the intent of Vassanar was not to control anything which could go on the individual's device precisely for that reason that an innocent victim crossing the border and be found. Now, as, as, as experts have analyzed the, um, the actual text and found various different ways in which potentially uh, um, code or, or um, executables on a victim's device could potentially be considered uh, uh, caught under Vassanar. Yeah, thank you. Oh, so here's a wacky thing under the U.S. implementation. Uh, the code is arguably not subject to control, but the comments to the code are yeah. definitely subject to control. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, I think we're kind of running out of questions from the room. And uh, number five. Oh, oh sorry. Then. One six. Um, you mentioned that hacking team very easily got a license. So why why w would it be very hard for all of us to get a license? Well, I think hacking team had a special relationship with the Italian regulator that allowed them to <laughs> to get that license. And I don't think people who, who want to play with software and figure out the problems with it should have to register with their government uh, in order to get a license. They, they probably should be able to conduct the, the, the research themselves because then you're running into the problem of, well, supposing somebody in, in Canada gets their hands on FinFisher or Hacking Team and then they have to go and register for a license with Canada who are potentially customers of FinFisher and Hacking Team to say, hey, I'm doing reverse engineering or malware analysis on the very tools that they have bought. Um, I wonder if that information stays within the, the authorization uh, department or whether that may potentially get passed to the companies who are involved in the, uh, in the sale of the, the material so that they get tipped off that, hey, somebody's got a, a sample of your latest malware version and uh, you might want to think of changing it. I mean, one thing that could, you know, one one thing that could be done to sort of point out the absurdity of uh, of particularly restrictive uh, licensing requirements, you know, could be the equivalent of a work to rule strike. Um, DDoS the, uh, the the licensing agency with requests for every <laughs> single time you install OpenSSL. Um, so that's one possibility. And on that note, uh, thank you all for your attention, and uh, enjoy. <laughs>